Has something gone wrong with the natural order of things? I've personally known women who, for one reason or another, couldn't have children. They were devastated. Something deep and primal in them couldn't be fulfilled, and it was the tragedy of their life. Now, growing numbers of women are saying that they've decided never to have children because of climate change and their fears generally for the future. These are the young people of our time, and some of them are essentially giving up on life itself. That should concern us all. In this video, we ask whether the fears are justified, if you have a child, or indeed a grandchild, what sort of world can they expect to grow up in? Let's have a look. Over the last few years, we've seen unprecedented levels of coverage about the problem of climate change. It's a real problem. Various countries are trying to work out how to move to zero carbon energy. But there's no doubt that the mainstream media and the environmental campaigners have tended to focus on worst case scenarios, apocalyptic language to feed our interest in their stories, to reward therefore their advertisers or with the campaigners to recruit new people to their campaign. Code red for humanity, on track for climate catastrophe. No doubt you're familiar enough with the sort of thing. And the campaigners have gone further some of them deliberately pushing the message that the children of today would have terrible lives and shorter ones at that because of climate change. And that has led to an increase in people saying that they have now decided, or at least they're considering, that they shouldn't have children because of climate change. In November last year, there was an academic study that surveyed 600 people aged 27 to 45 who said that they were already factoring climate issues in some way into their decisions around children. The vast majority of that concern focused around the sort of world that their children would inherit. 96% said they were very or extremely concerned about the well-being of their children in such a world. Now, those were people who'd already expressed a prior concern. But how representative were they? A different poll in 2020 of US citizens without children between the age of 18 to 44 years old found that 11%, well over 1 in 10, cited climate change as a major reason for not having children, with an additional 15% adding it as a minor reason. Just last month, analysts at financial services firm Morgan Stanley said in a note to investors, the movement to not have children owing to fears over climate change is growing and impacting fertility rates quicker than any preceding trend in the field of fertility decline. How did they arrive at that conclusion? Well, they pointed to a number of surveys, research and Google data that suggest that climate change is directly and indirectly boosting the pre-existing decline in fertility rates. For instance, UCLA researchers showing in 2018 that the number of births in the US fell in the nine months after an extreme heat event. It's not wholly convincing, because if you look at the actual study they're quoting there, it reports that the effect seems at least partly short-lived, with a rebound in births over the subsequent months. So the idea that this is an issue being increasingly discussed, that is clearly the case, certainly. How much of that is following through in practice to lifetime decisions, possibly equally the case, not yet proven. But it is certainly being discussed, sometimes by very high profile and influential figures. Miley Cyrus was one who said that she refused to hand a degraded planet down to a child. Until I feel like my kid would live on an earth with fish in the water, I'm not bringing in another person to deal with that. Another one that made headlines was American liberal progressive Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who in an Instagram live stream to her one and a half million followers said this, basically there's a scientific consensus that the lives of children are going to be very difficult. And it does lead, I think, young people to have a legitimate question. Is it okay to still have children? But if we turn away from the celebrities and whatever we think about their public statements for now, you can find plenty of testaments from ordinary people about how they're feeling. Here's a few from the various pieces of research and some of the media coverage. 27-year-old woman. I feel like I can't in good conscience bring a child into this world and force them to try to survive what may be apocalyptic conditions. 31-year-old woman. Climate change is the sole factor for 
for me in deciding not to have biological children. I don't want to birth children into a dying world, though I dearly want to be a mother. 40 year old mother, I regret having my kids because I am terrified they will be facing the end of the world due to climate change. Woman of unknown age, every time a family member or friend announces they are expecting a baby, I am overwhelmed with sadness and helplessness. I know I am meant to say congratulations, but I don't feel happy. 39 year old woman, I refuse to bring children into the burning hellscape we call a planet. 39 year old man, I had a major depressive episode last year based on existential angst over the world my children would be growing up in. Worrying about their future is a frequent trigger for me. I'm constantly thinking about when it's going to be appropriate to dissuade them from having children of their own as I think we're really past the point of no return. 32 year old woman, if my hypothetical children were to ask me one day why did you bring me onto the planet knowing what a dire situation it was in, there's no reasonable answer I could give to justify my actions. To be fair, that's not really the sort of question that kids ask. It's like all those old memes of what did you do during the war, daddy? More likely kids will be rolling their eyes about daddy going on about those boring old war stories again. I mean, look, they might ask you why you didn't also fix the planet single handedly while also bringing them into the world. I mean, come on, people, multitasking. I've never yet heard a child berate a parent with how dare you bring me to life. I could be wrong. You might think that the ingratitude of such children is a bigger reason not to have had them in the first place, but I digress. That to one side, those quotes seem reasonably representative of how some people are feeling. Fear for the life experience of your future children seems to be the most common and possibly the most potent reason for this. It's not the only one. The other main one, and maybe this is more the activist specifically, I'm not sure, is the idea that having children increases the burden on the planet, part of your personal carbon footprint. And that's fed by studies like this one by Wines and Nicholas in 2017, which looked at various individual lifestyle actions that people could take to reduce their impact on the climate and decided that the biggest one was to have one fewer children. The absence of a child in a developed country would reduce your personal emissions by 58.6 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per year. We'll come back to those arguments in a few minutes because there's some really important things to be said about them. This isn't the first time in history where people have been left wondering about the morality of bringing children into the world. I certainly remember similar conversations, not amplified via social media of course, when I was a young adult and we were utterly convinced that a nuclear apocalypse was literally around the corner. And it used to be said that if there was a full scale nuclear war, the survivors would quickly come to envy the dead. The fear was a reasonable one and it was palpable. And we now know that it, we came closer to it happening than we even realized at the time. Now, of course, if you passed up your chance of parenthood at that time and on that basis, you came to realise after the event that you did make the wrong call. And actually, your child would have grown up in the most privileged time in human history. If we're adding historical perspective, you would probably reflect on the fact that most generations of humans throughout history faced much worse outlooks than we face today. People continue to have children through times of plague, through the most brutal wars, through times of extreme poverty and hardship that was very difficult to escape. If humans had had the attitude that the potential for future suffering was a reason not to have children, we would have died out long ago. Now, in some ways, it's meaningless context. The human race had only ever known that level of suffering at the time. And you just don't question these things when what you see is what you have come to know as normal. You just try to work out the best way to survive it yourself and to raise your child to cope with the demands of life such as they are. And of course, we also had less choice anyway, because effective birth control wasn't a thing. So now in the modern era, birth control is a thing. And we're used to the idea of choosing. Indeed, having children is now described as a lifestyle choice 
which people of ages past would probably find rather jarring, I suspect. And it's an issue because we become used to a higher level of comfort and the widespread belief that the future will be by many degrees extremely worse, intolerable. The starting question is, why do we believe that? Is it because we read the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and see direct evidence in those reports that that's how it's going to be? Well, no, because that's not what they say. No IPCC report has predicted that the children of today or of the near future are going to live in, quote, hell on earth. Some of the headline writers give that impression. Some of the politicians might echo that sentiment, and certainly a number of the extremist campaigners, such as Extinction Rebellion, will say it directly. But all of those are incentivised to take a demonstrable bias towards the negative. The headline writers and the journalists operate in a media ecosystem where they're supported by advertising and stories have to get clicks to pay returns. Negative stories have always sold more newspapers and now generate more clicks than the alternative. If it bleeds, it leads, was a famous saying of many decades past. And that's given us all, as a society, a perception bias. It's been shown that when it comes to a variety of measures, we presume negatives. Hans Rosling would ask people if they thought things like whether absolute poverty had gone up or down, if infant mortality worldwide had gone up or down, and a range of other social measures. People often assumed the worst, that these things had all gotten worse, whereas actually they were massively positive. Indeed, given a multiple choice of questions on a range of social issues, he observed that most people performed less well than dart-throwing chimpanzees, his evocative way of saying chance. And that's because of a negative perception bias. Because our brains pay attention to negatives, filter out positives, even if we see them, which we often don't. The IPCC reports often include scenarios of how much we pollute in the future and therefore how severe the consequences would be. Here's a best case scenario, a mid-ground scenario which describes where we are if we stay on the current track, and an extreme worst case scenario which is significantly worse than we expect. The news headlines are often shaped on that worst case scenario. There are countless headlines about what could or what might happen and that's a giveaway that you're having an unlikely worst case pushed into your brain. When it comes to the extreme climate campaigners, on the one hand their own perceptions are shaped by exactly the same process but also they shape their campaign slogans in the ways that they believe will get the most response, the emotional response, that will make it more likely that you will sign up with them to become an activist. Extinction Rebellion have done that by explicitly preaching the worst doom and destruction messages, which when they get interviewed by professional interviewers is quickly shown to be completely out of line with the actual research. They feel it's an acceptable campaign tactic to put the fear of God into you explicitly for the future of your children because partly they've taught themselves into believing their own hubris and partly because they believe the end justifies the means. So Extinction Rebellion did protest where they poured red dye with campaign messages that misrepresented the blood of our children. Campaigners like Rupert Reed would tell children that their parents had failed them and it was now not a matter of what they would do when they grew up, but what they would do if they grew up. An Extinction Rebellion founder, Roger Hallam, did a long video on YouTube purporting to offer advice to young people facing annihilation. None of that's accidental. It's part of a publicly acknowledged campaign strategy. Climate scientists have sometimes pushed back on those claims. Dr. Tamsin Edwards, for instance, who took Rupert Reid to task on Twitter for what he had said to children on his video because it was simply not true. But if we go back to the research and ask, what does it suggest for what is likely to happen? And I mean, if the human race failed from this point to make any additional adaptations beyond what's already been done, which is not the plan, it's not likely to be the case. But if it did happen that way, the IPCC pathway we're on would see us potentially hitting 3 degrees Celsius by 2100, which is beyond the expected lifespan of most children alive today. Every part of a degree less than that will make things slightly better, but let's play the worst likely case game and ask what would those children be likely to see during that period. 
Notwithstanding a temporary slump due to COVID, right now life expectancies generally are higher than they have been through human history. That's part of the context. We've got healthcare beyond anything that people could have imagined even half a century ago. We have comprehensive education systems. We have many potential opportunities for how people can choose to live their lives. Astonishing technology, all sorts. Now, sure, we've been through COVID the last couple of years and that has put everyone under stress and there are always worries and issues and concerns as there always are. But those basic advantages that we have are not expected to go away. On the climate side, if we ended up sliding to that 3 degrees C temperature, which I stress nobody should be complacently saying would be fine, we want to avoid it. But if we did, what would we see? More quickly rising sea levels. If it gets to the upper level of possibilities, coastal cities will have to defend themselves from encroachment. Some will have to physically relocate. That will be hugely inconvenient and costly for those countries. But a managed retreat is obviously what is going to happen. While that shouldn't be waved away as being a trivial thing, being simple and as of no consequence, there's no reason why that makes your child especially unhappy in their adult life. There's likely to be more frequent extreme weather events. We've seen some of those already, as we have in the past. And there's no doubt we may get some particularly nasty ones. It may become more regular, like we saw with the recent heat dome in Northwest America. Does that in itself make life intolerable? Not really. And if they become more frequent, our societies will adapt to cope with them better. Some older and vulnerable people die in the most extreme heat waves, but in countries that expect such temperatures more often, they have more air conditioning in the home and public buildings. They design buildings to be more reflective of heat. I'm not saying there won't be negative consequences. There were to the events this year. Nobody who lived through those went on record as thinking that this was so bad if only their parents had avoided giving birth to them so that they didn't have to endure it. Some of the areas where we grow food will change local climate and we will have to adapt either by growing different staples in those areas that suit the conditions or using genetically adapted versions of the existing crops that perform better in those conditions. Lots of people who want to sell tales of doom to you, their scenarios for the future presume no adaptation. They simply say, if this external thing changed and we try to carry on doing everything exactly the same, what would be the impact? And you know, that question tells us something doesn't tell us what's actually going to happen because of course we're going to adapt. It's what we've always done. Right now we have a pretty effective world food production system and there are many parts of the world where continuing to improve the application of existing techniques and technology will make it more efficient still. Can you have a bad year and have several important areas hit by particularly bad weather events? Well, sure. I mean, that is actually normal. There's almost always certain areas where crops have been reduced by bad weather. But could that scale up because of more extreme events? Well, yes, it could. And that would put the system under pressure as we deal with the consequences of that. Now, there's nothing to suggest that suddenly the world is going to be starving and societies are going to be breaking down, as some of the campaigners would have you believe. In the last hundred years, we've had lots of bad weather and crop failures. But in that recent period, there haven't been famines because of bad weather. There have been famines because of bad political choices, such as Chairman Mao's Great Leap Forward in China. But modern systems, while not being infallible, are quite resilient to stress. Now, they could be even better, something that the current post-COVID chaos is bringing home. So, yes, people are already talking about the need to move to systems away from the just-in-time model, more to a just-in-case model. In other words, we're looking at how we need to adapt to better understood future uncertainties. It's what we do. Optimism about our historically proven abilities doesn't have to be interpreted, of course, as hopeless complacency. We shouldn't give in to that. I recognise that it's hard to hold the conviction when a lot of people out there are using the most dramatic language when they're talking about these issues in public. Usually, though, because they're campaigning. They're trying to persuade people to take the issue seriously, which it should be. But you shouldn't have to start an epidemic of eco-anxiety across young people in the process of doing so. And that's what they're doing. But what about the other argument? that avoiding having a child is the biggest impact you could have on your personal carbon reduction. 
People have produced reports with graphs like this one. And the way it's presented, let's face it, it's pretty stark, right? Well, it would be. Except that once again, these figures are assuming a status quo that we're simply not planning for. That graph presumes that your child's carbon emissions match today's, and it stays that way going into the future. Well, increasingly, all the major powers are signing up to net zero carbon targets for their energy supplies. Maybe they will get there later than they hope, but nevertheless, on the journey, the carbon intensity of the energy supply is going to be reducing and that makes a difference to the relative weighting of those sorts of graphs. This version shows how massively that column shrinks when you factor that in. And as we go, the effectiveness of clean technology will continue to improve because that's what we see with new technologies. Once we've achieved zero carbon, then all of those sorts of measures become irrelevant. In fact, of course, if you raise your child as a good conscientious citizen ready to make a contribution to society, maybe they will be amongst the people helping to make those solutions and make them work better. In any case, as a species, we've come through a number of crunch points. Malthus's predictions of overpopulation for one, where innovation and ingenuity provided the solutions that earlier doomsayers hadn't accounted for. And this is an obvious point. Such a graph dehumanises your child attributes his or her impacts to you as the basis of your lifestyle choice and it only records negatives, every human as burden. Well, there's a few humans that may be only a burden, not many. Mostly people are measured in terms of what they can contribute and we will need people's participation to solve the various problems ahead of us, just as they solved huge ones that are now completely behind us that we take for granted. As someone who cares about the future, you have the opportunity to raise a child or children plural with the right values and outlook to want to add their stamp to our problem-solving species. Why? When we have problems to solve, would you assume the best thing to do is not to bring someone in the world because you presume we will fail, rather than bringing them into the world in order to play their part in helping us to succeed? It rather suggests that we've lost sight of our ability to be people who see themselves as having a higher purpose. Have we become people who expect with no effort or struggle whatsoever to have comfort and happiness handed to us on a plate as an entitlement? Maybe it's worth reflecting on the words of Viktor Frankl. Frankl endured three years in a Nazi Germany concentration camp, an experience that the rest of his family did not survive. Standing next to him, we have little right to despair, you would think. He said this, It did not really matter what we expected from life, but rather what life expected from us. We needed to stop asking about the meaning of life and instead to think of ourselves as those who were being questioned by life daily and hourly. Our answer must consist not in talk and meditation, but about action and in right conduct. Life ultimately means taking the responsibility to find the right answer to its problems and to fulfil the tasks which it constantly sets for each individual. Parents have the job of raising young adults with the right values. On the basis of history alone, it's going beyond the brief to make those sorts of bigger decisions on their behalf before they've even taken a breath of life. Whether you decide to have children, for whatever reason, of course, it's entirely up to you. But give them the favour of seeing them as future humans with agency who will be made stronger by having challenges to overcome. Not people that need to be protected from the world to the degree of never even escaping the womb. Now, I said that the most fear-inducing messages are spread by the extreme campaigners. If you're still worried that they must be right, I made a video responding to Extinction Rebellion founder Roger Hallam's advice to young people as they face annihilation. If you want more on the graphic way that fear in young people is being invoked, along with more detail that refutes the specific claims they're making, you might want to watch that video next.